Thank you for accommodating us as we spread you off to like, talk to this side and then come talk to this side. <laughs> we generally have the lectures oriented so that we I project onto the back wall, but this is a 12-foot painting that's rather hard to, to move, so we decided to, uh, to put it on this wall. So I hope everyone can, can see. If anyone has some difficulty, uh, just let me know after the, the presentation. I can always send you a PDF copy of it, so if you wanted to take a look at the, the images a little more closely. Okay, so up tonight we have uh, Michelangelo and Julius II. And Julius II is the, the titan pope of the high renaissance. It was really his vision that drove the, the high renaissance in Rome and, and then kind of trickled out and drove the high renaissance in the rest of, of Italy. So one of the most important figures, and he was the one who pulled Michelangelo from Florence uh, to work in Rome. And before the end of the night, I will explain why Moses, this is Michelangelo's depiction of Moses, has little horns. It's a great story. If you ever see some bearded old man in Renaissance and Baroque art with horns, it's Moses. And I'll tell you why in about an hour. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, you have to find out, right? Okay. So this is, uh, this is Michelangelo. This is a, a portrait we have uh, that's, uh, that's attributed to De Volterra, who was a follower of Michelangelo. So you've probably seen images of him. He actually pops up in, uh, in, in Raphael's School of Athens. He's always sort of depicted as sort of a dark-haired, bearded figure, rather uh, grumpy looking. Michelangelo reigned triumphant. He was the, the, the darling of the, of the Florentine Renaissance in the late 1400s. He triumphs with, with two particularly early, uh, early stunning, stunning works. The first was the Pieta. He did these in his early 20s. No big deal, <laughs> Michelangelo. Uh, yeah, so he, this was actually commissioned uh, by a patron in, in Rome, and it was installed in the Vatican, where you can still see it today. I think, personally, it's a horrible place for this particular work. It's a sidebar. Uh, it's really challenging to see it. It's when, when you go in, first go into St. Peter's Basilica, it's to the, to the right in kind of a little niche, and there's behind bulletproof glass because some maniac went at it with like an ice pick or something. Anyway, it's, uh, it's, it's not very big. It's about life size, but in the, the enormity of St. Peter's Basilica, it looks rather small, and so you kind of lose the the sentimentality and kind of the, the delicacy of this, of this work. But this, this knocked the socks off both the, the Roman community and the Florentine community and, and rocketed uh, Michelangelo into, into fame and he became known as the, the, the preeminent sculptor of this particular time. And then of course he leaves the Pieta and then he works on the David in Florence and this is supposed to be uh, installed at the top of the Palazzo della Signoria, so the, the city hall in Florence. And that's why the, uh, I have, when I teach this at the university, oh, my students invariably point out that the hands are too big and the head's too big, and it's really strange. So it was supposed to be viewed at the very top of the palazzo, and so from the ground, the body would have looked more proportional. But when Michelangelo revealed it to the, to the Florentine fathers or the, the, the city council, they thought it was far too beautiful to install at the top of the building, so it was placed in the Piazza della Signoria, where you can still see a copy. Uh, it's not outdoors. The original, of course, is in the Accademia in, in Florence inside, <laughs> so it's not subjected to the elements, but you can still see a, a copy in the, in the Piazza. But 13 feet high, there hadn't been anything like this since the... the uh, uh, classical Greek and Roman age, so it was, it was something that was, was new and triumphant and, and uh, really captured the, the age of the spirit of the, the Renaissance. And then Julius II comes to power in Rome. I know he's looking rather aged and fragile here. <laughs> he was, I'll tell you more about him, but he was actually known as, Julius II is known as the warrior pope. And uh, 
he was was quite a fearsome figure and, and carved a path through through history and, and literally through Rome. But he, he comes to power in uh, in 1503. And immediately, immediately, he was a raging narcissist, okay? A raging narcissist. He, be, he immediately begins to think about his tomb and how he will be remembered throughout history. Where shall I be entombed? And there had been a tradition of, of rather nice uh, papal tombs. So this is a tomb of Sixtus the Ninth, or uh, Fourth, sorry, Ninth, uh, done by Paleolo. This is in bronze. It took Paleolo nine years. He worked on this for nine years. No one cares about it now, but good job, Paleolo. <laughs> so it looks more like a sarcophagus. It's rather stately. So Julius uh, has, has this option for his, for his uh, resting place. But he's also starting to look around Rome and, and, and noticing at the, in, the, in, the, in the Renaissance, they're starting to notice the, the remnants of the Roman Empire that had been, they'd fallen into ruin and there were literal ruins and remnants kind of strewn about Rome and they, in this particular time, they were just starting to rediscover them and excavate them and, and trying to figure out what exactly was the civilization and what was their, uh, what were their aims. So Julius, he notices the, the mausoleum of Augustus, which is in the form, he's, oh, that looks pretty good but it was in ruins. But then the mausoleum of Hadrian was in pretty good shape. This is the castle of St. Angelo. This is the tomb, this is the tomb of the Roman Emperor Hadrian, and it housed, it housed Hadrian and his family. So the options were papal tomb, traditional papal resting place, or ta -da, Roman <laughs> resting place. And Julius, true to form, says, this is lame. <laughs> I prefer something like this. And he needed an artist. He needed an artist and an architect who was equal to that particular task. I want a, I want a tomb. I want a mausoleum that is uh, equivalent to that of the Roman emperors. And he was particularly struck by Michelangelo's Pieta. And, and he thought, I'm going to get this young sculptor from Florence to come down to Rome and craft a tomb for me worthy of the Roman emperors. And this is uh, one of the versions that, that Michelangelo came up with for, for uh, Julius. And, and Michelangelo crafted this tremendously, tremendously ambitious plan. He wanted to build a, a mausoleum that would be it's like 30 feet wide and 50 feet high. And at the top, there would be a, a statue of Julius himself, about 10 feet high, Julius, with his papal tiara reigning over the, the mausoleum for all posterity. There would be over 40 marble statues. 40, right? I mean, the David is one. Julius is like, you can do 40, Michelangelo. I mean, Michelangelo, it would have taken, I guess I'm giving this away. This wasn't, was never quite finished. <laughs> Right? I'll explain why. It troubled, this project plagued Michelangelo for the next 40 years. He called it the tragedy of the tomb. It never worked the way it was supposed to work. But in the beginning it sounded good. So like I said, he envisioned over 40, uh, 40 uh, individual figures set within niches and arches and columns. These were all the news at the, the first tier were all connected to the humanities. Oh, it was a big project. So Michelangelo, uh, the Pope entices him with a boatload of money, a boatload, pays him like 1,200 ducats. It sounds ridiculous when I say it. I'm like, I'm making this up, but no, I'm not, I promise. A ducat is a gold coin. And uh, it's the same thing as a florin. A florin it had the same kind of uh, value, a, a gold coin. And a, a salary for a, a tradesman or a craftsman was about 100 to 120 uh, ducats per year. So 1,200, yeah, 1,200 per year annual salary was a, was a you know, was, was, was a good offer. It's a good offer, Julius. Uh, so Michelangelo agrees, okay, that's a good project. 
he comes to Rome, and uh, there's a quarry, a marble quarry nearby, and he spends eight months excavating marble for, for, this, uh, for this project. And then abruptly, Julius pulls the plug. <laughs> so I'll fill in a bit more about Julius the, the second and, and, and his origin and, and kind of what his, his plan is and, and why he is so where he was the way he was. So here's a, a fresco depicting the early, early Jul young Julius. He was born uh, Giuliano della Rovere. He was the son of a fisherman, oddly enough. He had this very inauspicious beginning to his life. Uh, but he was studious. He studied Roman law in Perugia. Uh, and then eventually he became ordained and joined the Franciscan order. But, oh, he got a lucky break when his uncle, yay for uncles, Sixtus IV, came to power in 1471, and good old nepotism just kicked into, <laughs> kicked into gear. The word nepotism literally comes from the Italian nipote, so that means nephew. <laughs> it's good to be the Pope's nephew. Generally, they weren't nephews, they were nephews. <laughs> But Giuliano actually was, uh, was the, 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 real, the real nephew. So he was, he was immediately appointed, uh, 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 raised to cardinal status under his uncle. He became the, the bishop of Ostia, um, the archbishop of Avignon. He had this whole string of very, uh, uh, very kind of illustrious posts. But then his luck ran out. In 1492, his mortal enemy, oh, they hated each other's guts. Uh, Rodrigo Borgia, played with malevolent glee lately by Jeremy Irons in a show called The Borgias. I've only seen bits of it, so I can't recommend it one way or the other, but if somebody was going to portray the evil, debauched Borgia Pope, Jeremy Irons, he, he makes a good bad guy. So. Uh, Rodrigo Borgia comes to power in 1492. He hates Giuliano della Rovere. The della Rovere's and the Borgias were mortal enemies. Uh, the Borgia Pope Alexander, that's so Juli uh, Rodrigo Borgia is his family name and becomes Alexander, Pope Alexander. He strips uh, Giuliano, Julius, of his, all of his offices and then for good measure tries to poison him. <laughs> Oh, just a little, a little tidbit. Uh, this is a, so Rodrigo's son. If he, he was very open about his. He he didn't even bother calling them nephews. Like they were just. This is my son. This is my daughter. So he had very famous children. His son Cesare was so dastardly. He was the model for Machiavelli's The Prince, right? So kind of this ruthless uh, seizure of power. Uh, where was I? Oh, yes, yes. So Alexander uh, uh, tries to poison Giuliano della Rovere. Doesn't succeed, obviously. But Giuliano decides that Rome is not a hospitable place for him to be anymore. So he leaves for France and spends a number of years uh, more or less in hideout from the Borgias in France. And then the Borgias reign supreme for about 10 or 12 years in Rome. Alexander drains the papal coffers. He builds three palaces for himself because one is never enough, <laughs> probably to house all his mistresses. He reportedly had an affair with his daughter Lucrezia. Oh, incest. And <laughs> Tresere was up to all kinds of things, poisoning people and bumping off his enemies. And he was a, he was a, 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 a troublesome character. But good thing he dies in 1503 <laughs> and there was a pope there was a pious in there for just a few weeks but he he died very quickly i mean i'm not like <laughs> <laughs> but uh but giuliano della rovere threatens and bribes his way into the pontificacy is that the right word? anyway the papacy uh and he becomes uh, Pope Julius II, and 
during his reign, he, he, he was in power for 10 years, 1503 till his death in uh, 1513. He was known as uh, Il Papa Terribile, so that's the, uh, the dreadful pope, <laughs> right? Like I said, he was also known throughout history as the, as the warrior pope. He grew a beard in defiance of, of papal tradition. No other popes had, had beards. He thought it made him look fearsome. Uh, he had a monstrous, monstrous temper. Uh, he was known to punch and flail his, his underlings. It was a troublesome job to be, his, to be his assistant, I think, or a dangerous one. Maybe he had to have a thick, a thick skin. I've already talked about his, the size of his, his ego, and not like he came to power in 1503 and then immediately started planning this monstrous uh, mausoleum for himself. But he also had grand plans for the, the papacy. He wanted to, to expand the, the grandeur of, of the Vatican, the grandeur of Rome, and then in Italy itself, and the, like the papal states. Very challenging to work with, uh, as we'll see from the, the tumultuous relationship between him and Michelangelo. They butted heads quite often, where Julius would say, take this boatload of money and make this thing for me. And Michelangelo says, no, I want more money. And Julius says, you're a big pain. I'm never hiring you again. And Michelangelo says, fine, I'll stay in Florence. And, but then they get together and they reconcile and then they start the, the cycle all over again. But uh, Julius, um, there was a, uh, there's a Venetian uh, ambassador to the papal court at the time. And he said that, uh, that, that Julius was like a, a giant in, in body and spirit and that he could bend the world to his vision or bend the entire world to his, to his will. But he was so difficult to work with that on his deathbed, the last words of this Venetian ambassador were that he was really happy that he didn't have to deal with Julius anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, I hope I have that lasting influence, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Poor Caleb, was like, oh. <laughs> yes. Uh, no, where was I? Being a pain, being a pain to our, our coworkers. Um, uh, I think I saw to tell you about that. Uh, yeah, so, so Julius, um, he, he was, there, there was a bit of a, a conundrum for him because, because that darn Pope, uh, Rodrigo Borgia and all of his extravagances had drained the, the papal coffers and also the, the papacy had suffered uh, kind of some, some reputational setbacks. There had been uh, a, a great schism uh, for a period of time during the 1300s and 1400s where there were for a while two popes and then for a while three popes because they couldn't agree on who was, so there was a rival papacy set up in Avignon in, in France, and uh, people were very confused because God gave the keys to heaven to Peter, and Peter didn't mean for it to be given to other. Anyway, it was very, very complicated, very troublesome period during the, the schism, and, uh, and so the papacy, it was, it was suffering a, an image problem, it was having an image problem, and Julius, uh, so Julius knew he had to raise some money, so he set out uh, to do uh, very, he, uh, he in, uh, embarked on a ruthless taxation campaign for all of the papal states. He set up um, the selling of ecclesiastical offices, uh, which is simony, it's the sin of, of simony, which Dante puts uh, those who perpetrate simony in the eighth circle of hell. So according to Dante, Julius would be in the eighth circle of hell. So that's how he's trying to raise money from the selling of, of offices. And then famously, I mentioned this in a previous lecture, he came up with the idea, such a great idea, of the sale of indulgences, which was uh, basically uh, you could sell, the, the, the church started selling passes like to, to, that people could buy to get their loved ones or themselves out of purgatory. Uh, so, <laughs> Ingenious, ingenious, because there's no way to prove, like, yes, this works. <laughs> this really works. You better buy, us, buy some more for your other relatives, because it's so effective. Um, and, and 
he needed this money because he had a, a vast vision for the rejuvenation of, of, well, of the Vatican, but then also of Rome itself. So Rome, Rome was the traditional seat of papal power. It's where uh, Peter was crucified, and that's why St. Peter's Basilica was built on that, on that site. Rome was known, rather ironically, as the Caput Mundi, so that's the capital of the world, Caput Mundi. But in the late 1400s, Rome was a dump. Rome was a dunghill. It was like a fetid swamp of disease and poor urban planning. The Tiber was uh, gross, uh, poorly drained. Sewer flowed all through the city, raw sewage. The, the streets were narrow and congested. The, the Roman infrastructure, the ancient Roman infrastructure, so the aqueducts and the, the sewer system were no longer functional. So Julius decides, okay, we need, to, we need to fix up the city itself. So he blasted through, put, put new boulevards and new uh, streets along the Tiber, dredged the Tiber so make sure it flows, <laughs> move the sewage out of the city, put in new sewer systems. Sewer systems are very important. New aqueducts. And he also decides to, to pull down uh, St. Peter's Basilica itself. He said, we need a bigger St. Peter's Basilica. And he cooks up this scheme with an architect named uh, Bramante. And I'll, I'll talk about Bramante a bit, but yeah, he was very involved with the, the construction of new, the new St. Petersburg, not St. Petersburg, St. Peter's Basilica. Uh, yeah, Bermonte, Bermonte came on board, and this is, there's, Michelangelo was, a, was kind of a great um, um, propagator of, of conspiracy theories. He thought everyone was out to, out to get him, and he thought that Bermonte especially had it out for him because the Julius, as I mentioned earlier, the, the funds were, were abruptly cut for the tomb project. And Michelangelo thought it was because Bramante, the Pope's architect, suggested to Julius that it was unlucky to build one's own tomb during one's own <laughs> lifetime. And so that's why, why Julius pulled, the, pulled the, the funds for the project. But it was also probably because Julius needed the money for all of the expansive architectural projects that he was embarking on. So he wanted to, for instance, connect uh, the St. Peter's Basilica to the Belvedere uh, Palazzo, the, the palace, which you can see the, the palazzo is over here and it connects all through to St. Peter's. I keep wanting to say St. Petersburg. So just to, to orient yourself, this is the, the Tiber. Oh, I forgot to tell you a story. You have to go back. <laughs> back, back, back. Yes, uh, talking about Rome being a, a, a dung heap. So, uh, you know how when you go to Rome, like you have to go, you go to the Capitoline Hill and there's the Capitoline Museums and they're great and you see the, the Hadrian with the, the horse equestrian statue and then you look down the hill and there's the Roman Forum and this is like the triumph of the Roman Empire, right? That was completely covered in, in uh, sod and silt and dirt. Like it just, it had been completely uh, ruined and unexcavated during the Renaissance. And the Capitoline Hill, was, was for goat herders. Goat herders hung out in the Capitoline Hill with their, and it had a, a name to talk about the, the, to signify Goat Hill. And then the, the Roman Forum itself was known as the Campo Vacchino, it's it the cow patty. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it was very, like very, very inauspicious. Like when I say Rome was a, a dung heap, like it, it literally was, the Roman Forum was a cow pasture. And, uh, and so, so Julius, part of his mission was to, to recapture the, the former glory of, of the Roman Empire. So he started excavating a lot of these sites and, and chasing out the, the cows. I knew I forgot a story. Yeah. So, so Bramante was involved in, in the reconstruction of St. Peter's and the Vatican Palace itself, and then connecting the, the, the Palazzo Belvedere with, the, with St. Peter's.
And the Sistine Chapel came to, to Julius's attention as well. And the Sistine Chapel is just, just kind of nestled into the side of the, the basilica. And the Sistine Chapel was near and dear to Julius's heart. It was built in the 1470s, 80s by his uncle, Sixtus. And that's where the name Sistine comes from, from Sixtus, yeah. Uh, this is the exterior as it would have looked in the 1400s. It's a very important uh, building and space. Uh, religiously speaking, this is where they have the, the papal conclave. This is where they choose the popes. It's the, it's the personal chapel of the pope. So it's very, uh, religiously speaking, it's a, it's a sacred space for, for the, the Catholic faith. But this is how the interior of the Sistine Chapel would have looked in the late 1400s. Uh, Lorenzo de' Medici sent a little posse of Florentine painters to Rome as a gesture of goodwill to the Pope because Florence was a separate city-state at the time. And so there are, there are paintings, frescoes, all around the lower levels, which no one pays any attention to now whatsoever, completely eclipsed by Michelangelo. The lower levels painted by Florentine, uh, Florentine artists and the ceiling, this is very uh, traditional for spaces of, of, at this time and of this type. It was painted in kind of a dark blue, and then it had gold stars covering the ceiling. So if it was plain, but it would have been uh, very beautiful. It would, blue is a very expensive paint, and gold, of course. But in, almost immediately after construction, the Sistine Chapel ran into some, some uh, architectural difficulties. The, oh, uh, I want to say substrate. I don't know if that's the right word. The, the dirt, the dirt that is built on the ground, right? Anyway, it started shifting. It's not great dirt. You know what I mean, right? Like, <laughs> the, yeah, that thing. Anyway, it, it, it started to shift. It just wasn't uh, built on solid enough ground. And uh, the, the walls began to crack. And then there appeared this enormous crack through the, through the ceiling. And so almost immediately after it was constructed, uh, within 30 years, it needed some, some major intervention. Uh, and Bramante and Julius decided that they were going to, to undertake the, the, the restoration and kind of the, the intervention into shoring up this particular space. And they needed to fix this crack. So they decided, well, Julius decided that, that he was going to call on Michelangelo. But Michelangelo was in a snit because Julius had pulled his funds from the tomb. So he said, I want, I want Michelangelo to come paint, come paint the ceiling. This is a quote. Bramante is being quoted by someone in a letter to, to Michelangelo. Bramante says that of Michelangelo, he said that Michelangelo doesn't have enough courage or spirit for it to paint the ceiling because he has not done too many figures, which was true. Michelangelo was a sculptor. He was not a, a painter, really, at all. And above all, the figures are high and in foreshortening. So it's, it is really high. The Sistine Chapel ceiling, if you've been there, like it's very high off the ground. And it, this is another thing from painting at ground level. And what that means by foreshortening, I can show you here. So this is a, a ceiling painting by, uh, by another Italian artist, Mantegna. What, what foreshortening is, it makes it look like, say this, this cherub figure, that his feet are closer to us than, than his head. And that's what, that's what foreshortening is. I talked about this last time too, that like say for instance, um, if you were just to, to paint me in profile like this, but if I was to hold out my hand to you, you, you know intuitively that just the way our depth perception works, that my fingers are closer to you than the rest of my body. But when you're painting that, it, this is much more challenging to depict this than it is to depict this, because then you're not seeing my entire arm. You have to show that the fingertips are bigger because they're coming towards you in space. It's really, really complicated. And, and you had to be really good at this if you were going to paint on the ceiling because you wanted to look like the ceiling was extending up into the sky. So it was, it was challenging. And Bermonte supposedly said, you're crazy, Julius. Do not hire Michelangelo for this job. He can't do it. But while Michelangelo was in Florence, 
he takes a commission for the, well, no, he enters into a competition uh, for, for a, a fresco uh, project. And this was, this isn't Michelangelo's original, this is a copy, but he, he does the, a plan for the Battle of Cassina. And this is very typical Michelangelo, we kind of know him for these kind of contorted bodies, lots of news, male, kind of rather uh, muscular male news, twisting and turning, like very uh, dramatic and dynamic scene. And uh, we have a few drawings remain from that. But it's so energetic, right? Like it's just lots of movement, uh, contorted bodies uh, moving in space. And Julius knows about this project. Julius has seen these cartoons. And he decides that, no, Michelangelo can do it. You don't know what you're talking about, Bramante. I'm going to hire Michelangelo for this particular job. But then, Julius gets distracted once again, says, put that project on hold, <laughs> Michelangelo, because the papal states were rebelling. So, so Julius takes off for, uh, where are we? Here we are down in Rome. The papal states extended through the center of Italy and up into the north here with Urbino and Bologna. Uh, the the anti-papal forces were amassing. He was always at war with the Venetians and also with the French. But at this particular time, like 1506-07, Julius goes off to war with the, with the Bolognians. He goes into battle himself, which is quite unheard of for a, for a pope. He has his own charger, a kind of armored horse with his sword and his beard. He makes uh, his cardinals go to war with him, which they do not like at all. <laughs> There's a great story of them traversing the, the mountains in this in the kind of northern Italian area. And, and there's snow up to the, it's, it's chest deep on, on his horses. And the cardinals are, oh, they want to go, they want to go home and go back to Rome. And Julius gets off his horse and starts beating them with the flat of his sword, encouraging them to, to carry on, to carry on the warrior pope. So, so they make it to Bologna and they, and they, they win for, for a while anyway, Re, retake this, this uh, papal state. And Julius once again summons Michelangelo. Oh, and I should tell you too, Michelangelo first refuses to do the Sistine Chapel ceiling. So that makes Julius mad. But then he goes to Bologna, has this great triumph, and he wants, he has this vision that he wants, a, I should have included an image of it, and he wants a, a great bronze sculpture to commemorate his, his triumph, his victory. So again, if you think of a, like the, the, the equestrian Hadrian, so that great bronze, like Roman emperor on his horse charging. So I think that's the kind of what he, what he envisions, this, this, this to commemorate this triumph. So who better than Michelangelo? And once again, Michelangelo had no experience working in bronze. He said, that's fine, you did the David, you can work on a large scale. And bronze is completely different from stone. Like I won't get into the, the logistics of it all, but it's very, very different, very challenging. But Julius says, no problem, set to work, cast it over and over again until it succeeds. So Michelangelo sets up shop in Bologna. He hates it in Bologna. It's a little rough around the edges. But, uh, but he perseveres and he creates a 15, no, 14 foot high sculpture of, of Julius in triumph. Unfortunately, we have no, uh, it, it doesn't exist any longer, this, this particular sculpture. We have no drawings for it. We have no idea what this would have looked like because the Bolognians re-seized their city. Uh, they toppled the bronze sculpture. They melted it down, I love this, they melted it down and cast it into a cannon, which they named, I know, which they named, are you ready for this? La Julia! <laughs> which of course is the feminized version of, of Julius, and, they, and, and Julius was still there and they shot cannons at, or, or cannonballs at the, the Pope's retreating backside as he scuttled back, to, <laughs> scuttled back to Rome. So then Michelangelo gets to leave uh, Bologna 
and go back to Florence, his home. Uh, anyway, so that particular campaign didn't work. We have no record of this particular work, but apparently it was a, it was a great triumph. But yes, it's a, it's a tragedy, but then we wouldn't have that great story of the canon. So, so in the time, though, between the, 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 that catastrophe of the melting down of that, that sculpture, around 1506-1507, Michelangelo ultimately does accept the commission for the Sistine Chapel ceiling. And he comes to Rome in 1508, and they start to pull down the, they make the, the, the repairs, and then they pull down the, the ceiling, that kind of starry ceiling that had been in place. Now, the, the difficulty with, uh, Bramante alluded to this, that, that, that Michelangelo would have to have enormous spirit to take on this project. Fresco is a, had been a, an ancient tradition, it had been something that, that the ancient Romans uh, had mastered uh, themselves. It's an incredibly long-lasting technique, and because it's so long-lasting, well, part of the the part of the, the characteristics that make it so long-lasting also make it one of the most difficult art mediums. How it works, the artist has to, uh, <clears throat> you have to, to mix up a, like a plaster, a mixture of, of lime and, and plaster, and you, you smear that on the wall, and then you only have about 24 hours. You have to paint in the wet, so you have to paint, but, but you mix your pigments in with water, and then the artist would paint directly on the, the wet plaster. And then there is a, a chemical bonding process, and the, 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 the pigments bond directly to the chemicals in the plaster itself. And then it fuses, and then it dries, and then it's set within the, the plaster itself. The colors are, are, are bound there. And so that's why we still have uh, Roman frescoes, and we have frescoes that are two, 3,000 years old, because it's essentially like it's, it's the plaster itself is the painting. Yeah, yeah. But it's so tremendously difficult because you only have those, those 24 hours in which to work. And you can't make adjustments. If you mess up, you can't paint it on dry. It'll flake off. So if you make a mistake, you have to hack it all off and start over again. This is very, very challenging. That's what happened with, I should do something on this sometime, but that's what happened with uh, Leonardo's Last Supper, is that he was experimenting with painting, uh, paint, using paint and, and doing it on dry plaster, and so it's all flaking off. And that's why it's, it's, it's yeah, you can't, it's, it's in very, very poor condition, so Leonardo couldn't hold back from, from experimenting, <laughs> but Michelangelo, no experimentation for Michelangelo, he wanted to do it the right way. But it's a, it's a, challenging, a challenging medium, and also, too, you have to, an artist has to plan what they're doing because, you, you, like I said, you only have um, so many hours in which to, to work. So often artists would do like a, a two-scale cartoon and then they would stipple the edges of the drawing and then they would lay the drawing on the wet plaster and then throw some kind of a powder, right, some kind of a chalk or a charcoal, and then they would pull the drawing off and then you would have the outline on there, so you're like, okay, I know where things are supposed to go, I'm not gonna mess up, I'm gonna make use of the time I have with the plaster being wet. It's really tough, and it's even tougher when you have to do it 40, 50 feet up in the air. So here, of course, is, the, is a finished project. Spoiler, he does it, it's great, great success. <laughs> But he spent, he spent four years, four years working on this project from 1508 to 1512. His first task is to, one, learn to fresco, because he hadn't done it before. <laughs> so he spent some time figuring out how this thing works. He also has to, to uh, construct, he was a marvelous engineer. I mean, just like, like Leonardo uh, kind of had a variety of interests in architecture and engineering was one of them. And he, and he constructed kind of ingenious uh, scaffolding uh, mechanisms that would allow the, the, the chapel to remain open while he was working on the ceiling. I won't go into a, a whole lot of detail on the, the ceiling or we'll, we'll be here, we will be here all night. Uh, but, but I'll tell you, I'll give you some of the, the highlights and some of the good, the good tidbits. 
So he started, uh, he started in 1508. These are all scenes. <sighs> Michelangelo said that Julius gave him a, a, a blank check, like he gave him free reign of whatever he wanted to be. Michelangelo, I trust you. You go paint whatever you want to paint. That's highly unlikely. He probably had a, a theological advisor. But it's all depictions of um, uh, Genesis and sort of early, early Judeo-Christian narrative. The early scenes, you can tell the early scenes that he did in 1508, 1509, they're on this side of the wall, and they're, they're, the figures are quite small. And he works for two years, and he gets to this point. And, he, and this is kind of going back in time. These are scenes of Noah. And then we get to scenes of Adam and Eve, the creation of Adam, and then the creation of the, the sun and the moon, and the creation of the universe, the separation of light and dark here. So, so we're kind of starting in reverse chronological order, but that's where Michelangelo himself started painting. And so he works for two years on these scenes, and they're very, like, they're very busy, full of oh, lots of like, very condensed, multi-figure uh, scenes here. But he, he gets to this point, and he, and he wants to see what it looks like from the floor. So he pulls down the scaffolding, and he kind of has a midway progress report. And he notices that from the floor, you can't make out the details of these panels. The figures appear too small from the, from the floor. So there's an abrupt shift here. And then he does the rest of the ceiling in the last two years. So he does a third of it, or even just a quarter uh, for two years. But then he gets, oh, he gets really good at fresco. He's figured it out. He had, stories are that he had, uh, he would have buckets of paint strung around his body. And then he had a brush, a brush for the light paint and a brush for the dark paint. And he was so good at it. Like his mastery of this was so much by the time he got to these later panels that he was working without cartoons. I was like, I don't need it. It's just in my head. And he would just go, go to it with his, brush for light and his brush for dark. I mean, it's like mind blowing. So anyway, you can see here that there's a, there's a marked shift in the size of the figures and the, the complexity of the scene. So it becomes much more reduced and simplified. And then of course, this is the most famous one that everyone knows. But see, there's just two figures here compared to you know 10 or even more. This is a little, I love this doodle. This is, this is a, a page from his notebook. And he's complaining about it like a crick in his neck, right, <laughs> from, from painting. My beard towards heaven, I feel the back of my brain upon my neck. I grow the breast of a harpy. Poor Michelangelo. My brush above my face continually makes it a splendid floor by dripping down. And then he has a little cartoon, a little doodle of himself painting up above his head with a, I mean, look at this. It looks like a marshmallow man, right, <laughs> with his hair and eyes. Mm. So he probably did paint standing on the scaffolding. I know there's kind of the, we, we kind of see him have this idea in popular culture of him laying on his back and painting, but that's probably not the case. He's probably standing and, and painting up over his head, which would have been so difficult. I whine about going to the studio all the time. I'm like, this is really hard work, guys, but <laughs> <laughs> painting overhead, oh. And I want to show you especially the, the, the ceiling is, is uh, rife with these figures. They're called the ignudi, the nude figures. Very muscular young men, uh, often uh, contorted and twisting, supporting the, the central panels here. And they're interspersed with, with the architectures, architectural elements. And I love this, this particular Sybil. This is the, the Libyan Sybil. It, it, this would have been based on a male model. You can obviously tell this is a male. Uh, Michelangelo used all male models. He was not interested in, in the female form, really, whatsoever. He, he was very interested in musculature. He thought that everything could be, could be expressed and defined through the, through the male form. But the, the, the kind of the, the superhuman strength of this and uh, the, the kind of the effortless lifting of the, of the book here. But then the, also the twisting, that twisting action. And then there's flowing and movement in the, in the drapery itself. So it's very dramatic, very dynamic. 
also, I'll tell you too, Ian, if you have any old art history books from like pre-1980s, Michelangelo is often described as a poor colorist because the, the Sistine Chapel, the ceiling, hadn't been cleaned for centuries. And so there were, you know, four centuries worth of gunk and soot and smoke and wax on the ceiling, and it looked brown. So in, in old photographs, I mean, this is black and white, but even in, in early color photographs, the, the Sistine Chapel ceiling, like I said, looks, looks kind of beige and brown. And so often, Mike, oh, Michelangelo, he, was, he didn't know anything about color. And then it was cleaned, extensively cleaned in the 80s, and, and they just pulled off layers and layers of grime and wax and then revealed, revealed this, yeah. Which is, I mean, it glows. It glows with these, like, oranges and, and purples. But I, I picked out these few images to, to show you, or give you an example of the, what this idea of the High Renaissance was and, and where it's coming from. Because it's very different from the, the Florentine Renaissance. So the Florentine, Florence had its heyday in the, in the early 1400s, so artists like uh, Botticelli and Fra Filippo Lippi. Then a crazy monk came to power and everybody got out of Rome. They had a bonfire of the vanities and burned a bunch of paintings. All bad. It was a bad scene in Florence, later 1400s. But the Florentine, if you can think of uh, Botticelli's Venus or Botticelli's Primavera, or like this example from Fra Filippo Lippi, it's a, it's a more refined, it's a more delicate. Uh, they're very interesting, kind of like this diaphanous drapery and the flow of hair and the curls. And Michelangelo and Julius II completely reject the Florentine aesthetic. And, and between them, they forge this new idea of the High Renaissance, which is much grander in scope. It's more dramatic. It's, it's literally more muscular. There's more uh, uh, dynamism in the movements. It's not so contained. And this is partly to do with, with Julius's excavation uh, around Rome. And uh, the story about this, this is called the Lacuan, and it's a, it's a Roman copy of a Greek original. So it's, a, it's an ancient Roman sculpture. It was found by a, a little boy who was running around the, the, the ruins around the Domus Aurea, and he falls through, and, uh, and then they, they notice this thing, and then they start the excavations, and, and Julius was there when they pulled it out of the ground, and reportedly, Michelangelo was there also when they, when they pulled this out, and they, the Roman people see this for the first time, and it just, it was, it was this uh, uh, triumph of, of humanism and this kind of idea of the Renaissance discovery and, and a renewal of interest in Greek and Roman uh, uh, aesthetic and ideology. And Julius wants to put, he's going to put it in the Vatican. It's going, and so they paraded it through the streets of Rome, and it's installed in the Vatican. That's where you can still see it, actually, is in the Vatican museums. But the story is here, this is the, it's a Trojan priest who warns, wait a minute, he warns Troy that they should not let in the Trojan horse. I always get confused with the Trojan horse. Anyway, the Greeks, he figures that the Greeks are up to something with the horse. Don't let the horse in. And then whatever god is on the side of the Greeks doesn't want him to reveal a secret, so they send serpents, and the serpents snag him and his two sons and haul him into the ocean. <gasps> so here's the moment when, when the serpents are entwining around the body, and just the, the, that contortion, this, this extreme serpentine contortion here, and look at the, the torso twisting, and every muscle in the torso is visible. And the, the agony in, the, in the, the placement of the arms and the face. But just the, especially if you look at the, the torso, and again, the, the musculature that, you can, that is revealed as the body is twisting and turning and straining. And then also they, they unearth uh, what's now called, it's called the Belvedere Torso. It's also in the Vatican Museums. This is all that remains, so the, the limbs and the, the head are missing. But look at the, I mean, again, the musket. I mean, it's, 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 this isn't Botticelli, right? Like, this is, this is Michelangelo. And Michelangelo sees this. Oh, and was I have to tell you? Yeah, Michelangelo's here for this. Um, Michelangelo uh, 
again, kind of reportedly, Julius asked Michelangelo to finish the Belvedere torso, asked him to complete, add the limbs and the head. And supposedly, this may or may not be true, but it's a great story. Supposedly, Michelangelo said that he couldn't because he would not be up to the challenge, that it was too perfect as it was. But that, um, that twisting of the body here and that, like the compression of the, the stomach muscles, you can see has a, has a, a, a visceral and immediate impact on Michelangelo and his work. I mean, look at the, the torsos in the Agnuti. Yeah. And then also it's very evident in the torso of, of, of Adam here. So this is, this is one of the most famous images of, of Western art, of course. It's hard to, to almost unsee it. We have so many parodies of it, but just to kind of look at it with fresh eyes, it's kind of like trying to look at the Mona Lisa. We don't, it's difficult to, to process it now. But this really is a, a, a marvelous symbol of the, the idea of the high Renaissance, that, that Adam, like this human figure is reaching out to God and God is reaching down to, to man. So it's a, it's a scene of great optimism and then also of great kind of dramatic strength and, and, and kind of an adventure that God's sweeping in on this, this kind of cloud and robe. And, and uh, again, he's a very muscular being and reaching down, Adam reaching up, and Adam in the concave. So it's very, um, yeah, optimistic optimistic gesture, which is what the, again, kind of the, the symbol of the, the high renaissance. I think he knew what he was doing. I don't think Bramante, I think Bramante missed the mark there. Pretty, pretty good, pretty solid, well done. Yeah. One thing, you can, so um, Michelangelo used uh, male, male uh, models for, for all of his figures. But, but obviously there are female uh, subjects, characters in the, so this is Eve that's kind of tucked under the, the arm of, of, of uh, God. And, and he's, his, the placement of the breasts are always off in this. This is the one thing where he just, oh, it's just a near miss, uh, Michelangelo. He could have used some, some female models. He could have, should have pulled a Titian and pulled some females into the, into the studio. But again, just to, to reiterate the, the complexity of the of, of fresco technique, like he would have had one shot at this, like one chance to get this right. And, and if he missed it, missed the mark, you, it, one would have to chisel off that entire section of plaster and start again, compared to something like, uh, like oil paint, which is much more forgiving. So an artist like, uh, like Leonardo later on and someone like Titian, Caravaggio, who we looked at uh, a few weeks ago, they could oil paint allow, it stays wet for a very long time. And so oil paint allows you to rework and rework and rework and you can paint over, you can do as many layers as you want. And so it's a very flexible, forgiving, it allows for experimentation. And, and fresco doesn't, there's no forgiveness working in, in fresco. So it was seen as, if you were a fresco artist, like that was the kind of the ultimate uh, achievement So, so the, the Sistine uh, Chapel is revealed in 1512. So like I said, it took Michelangelo four years to, to complete. Uh, it was received to, to great acclaim. Michelangelo is happy because he can return then to the tomb, get back to sculpting, work on those 40 figures. Unfortunately, Julius uh, falls seriously ill in 1513. And, uh, and he dies, so just after the, the completion of the Sistine Chapel ceiling. Michelangelo is still being paid by, this, by uh, Julius' successor to complete the, the mausoleum, to complete the tomb. So he works away and he finishes uh, a few of the, the pieces, but the funds keep getting chipped away and chipped away and chipped away. And then eventually it comes down to the grandsons of, of Julius, and, and, it's, and it's significantly reduced, and it becomes, a, it becomes more of a wall, a wall um, kind of architectural uh, structure. And it's placed in, oh, poor Julius, it's stuck in the St. Pietro and Vicoli, which is a church across from the Colosseum. 
So you can see it's a shadow of, of it's the, what the original conception was. Julius isn't even buried here. He's actually buried in the Vatican, so he's not even buried in his own tomb, which is a travesty. Poor Julius. <laughs> But it's not quite what he, what he envisioned. It's like, here's, here's Julius, you're kind of recumbent on this, not quite the 13-foot high statue with the tiara. And, and Michelangelo doesn't finish this until 1545, so he'd been working on it for 40 years. Yeah, the tragedy of the tomb, he hated it. <laughs> But it's still, it's worth visiting for this one particular uh, figure. And, and I think, I don't know, again, when I kind of think of Julius, I think of this, of this figure, I think it's really, I don't know, maybe I'm kind of reading too much into it, but I think it's a good symbol of his, of his uh, kind of authority or his attitude. So this is a, a very, it's a monumental sculpture of, of Moses. And he's seated, but there is there is movement to to the figure. So again, he's 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 moving to the moving to his left, and one of the knees are protruding here. But very muscular arms. This is very. Um, this is uh, that word kind of terrible again, like the 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 idea of being kind of dreadful or fearsome or wrathful. It's a very powerful image of Moses. I think the moral of the story is don't leave your tomb to your grandkids. <laughs> it will be significantly reduced. Take care of your own mausoleum. Hadrian got it right. Now I'll tell you about the horns. Has it been an hour? Good, there we go. So <laughs> the horns, uh, it, it, was a, it was a mistranslation. So what happened was that there was a, the Bible was translated from, from Hebrew, just kind of in the, in, around this, this time period a few hundred years earlier. And this is the, the time when Moses is descending from the, the mountain. So he's received the word of God. He has the, the tablets. And in the original Hebrew, it talks about rays of light emanating from his, from his head. But it was mistranslated as horns. There were horns <laughs> emanating from his head. So Moses always has little horns. Oh, which is great. Moses with horns. <laughs> so go, go seek out. This is just, it's really worthwhile, especially you know the backstory of, uh, of Julius and, and, find, and find this, this sculpture. Um, but it's always baffling. You can kind of stand there and wait, just wait for the tourists to say, why, why does he have horns? I don't understand. He'd be like, oh, I know. <laughs> it's a mistranslation. <laughs> ah, wonderful. Well, that's all. I don't have the next uh, lecture scheduled, but I have a few ideas, so it'll be popping up in three or four weeks. Um, I forgot to say at the beginning, but we, we gratefully accept uh, donations to help support the ongoing nature of, of, uh, of this lecture series. We hope we, to do, we hope to do one or two a month, and we record them all, thanks to my brother Caleb, and, and it's available for free on our website, and we have a YouTube channel. So we try to make it as open, as accessible as possible, so your donations go directly into funding that endeavor. And thank you again all for, for coming tonight. Thank you.